People are always asking me, or perhaps challenging me, to watch The Avengers. How do you know you won't like it, they say. What are you afraid of, they say. Well, I'm not afraid of anything, so I've gone and done it. I've watched The Avengers movie. And that said, I watched The Avengers movie from 1998, not the one from 2012. So you've been had a little bit, unless you read the title closely. Um, this is not the big comic book superhero thing. Um, it's an adaptation of a British television show from the 1960s. The show, The Avengers, uh, is what's pretty well known in England, I think. I don't really watch television, but I have seen that show, and I think it's pretty cool. It's pretty interesting. It's a unique, it's got a unique tone. It's the kind of thing that you pray Hollywood would never get its hands on. It's the kind of thing that you just hope would never be adapted into a major motion picture, especially not in the late 1990s. But that's exactly what happened. That said, this movie has a pretty impressive cast. Rafe Fiennes is in it. Uma Thurman is in it. Sean Connery is in it. Jim Broadbent is in it. Eddie Izzard is in it. Patrick McNee even comes back for a little cameo. He was the star of the original series. So it's got a pretty good cast, and yet it was a total flop. See, the twists, they just keep coming. It was a notorious flop. It's rated 3.9 on IMDb, probably the lowest rated movie I've ever reviewed, and it won multiple Razzies, probably the first film we featured on the channel to cop that illustrious award, right? People hated it. <laughs> Fans of the original hated it. The general public who didn't know the original, they hated it. Critics hated it. Even the people who were in it didn't seem that happy with it. And yet, <laughs> I actually think this movie isn't that bad. At least it's not 3.9 bad. I've seen it on lists of the worst movies ever made, and believe me, it is not, right? It's pretty bad, but I think people got a little bit carried away. I actually had fun watching the movie. I, I kind of enjoyed it. The Avengers is basically an impossible show to adapt right? If you know anything about the show, you can probably see why this was sort of doomed from the beginning. Now, it turns out there's actually a lot of reasons why the movie didn't come off. It wasn't exactly what I expected, but even before I watched it, I was curious how the heck they were going to bring this into the, into the, into the present time. Well, 1998. I guess the, the main thing is just that the original show was, was unconventional, and any adaptation was going to have to choose between loyalty to that show and legibility to modern audiences who don't know anything about the original, um, who weren't alive when it came out. In case you have not been living under a rock, I'll give a little bit of background about the series. It's a cool series. It was, like I said, a British TV show. It ran from 1961 to 1969. You might call that the 1960s. Most people are more familiar with the later seasons of the show, which were filmed in color and broadcast somewhat prominently in the United States. Patrick McNee was the, the standard throughout this entire series. He was there uh, for basically every episode. And he played a debonair secret agent named John Steed. He teamed up with three different woman, women, first Honor Blackman playing Kathy Gale. Linda Thorson was last playing Tara King. And most famously, most famously, we had the iconic Diana Rigg playing the iconic Emma Peel. It's tough to get to the bottom of the original show. It has a unique tone. It's a complicated show, and it was balanced, I think, between a lot of different cultural forces at a really complicated time, right? Overall, though, I guess you would say that it's spy-fi. It's sort of like Get Smart, but British, more surreal, and not overtly comedic. Maybe it's a bit like James Bond, but uh, less serious. There's actually a lot of overlap in terms of personnel between the Avengers and James Bond. Diana Rigg, Honor Blackman, and Patrick McNee all appeared in various James Bond films. Sean Connery, you may know, appeared in a few James Bond films, and of course he's in this movie. And Rafe Fiennes uh, was in James Bond after he was in The Avengers. Uh, the Avengers was one of his, his earlier movies, I think, which explains a little bit. The Avengers, like James Bond, actually, is in some ways really tied to some kind of traditional aristocratic English culture. But it's also fairly subversive. I guess at a glance you might say that Steed is the traditional one and his partners are more forward-thinking. The costumes kind of suggests that. Steed is famous for his suit, hat, and umbrella. That said, I'm not sure his character is entirely serious. He's sort of this, interior, this uh, endearing traditional British gentleman, right? But it's also a bit of a lighthearted take on that. There's it's sort of a spoof of, of this character. Patrick McNee, I think, I always am struck by, by his age when I watch The Avengers. He seems like a, maybe a little bit older, a little bit more gentleman-like than the average action hero, the average spy. Um, that's kind of interesting. So maybe he stands for this traditional thing, but like I said, there's a little bit of a, of a, of a uh, satirical undercurrent there. It's very lighthearted, um, and he also is kind of forward in some ways. 
Of course, when you look at Emma, his uh, counterpart, you can see from the costumes alone that something very different is going on here. Emma's wardrobe comes straight off the most fanciful of runways. All three of the women in the Avengers were really forceful characters. Maybe not overtly political, but they were action heroes in a way that wasn't so common. To save time, I'm only going to talk about Emma Peel from here on. The th three different characters actually have kind of different things going on, especially Kathy Gale, the earliest um, uh, partner. Series changed quite a bit um, as, as it went on, but we're just going to talk about Emma Peel. In the adaptation, they choose to have Uma Thurman play Emma Peel rather than invent a new character, which maybe wasn't a great decision. The original Emma is truly enchanting. Uh, there's a real subtlety to her character, though. She's quite proper, but also quite forward. Quite proper, but also quite forward. She's sort of at home in this gentleman's world in some ways, but she's also kind of forward-thinking and independent. Um, I think you'd, you'd know it if you saw it. She's absolutely fearless, um, but she's also totally refined. Hmm, interesting. A large portion of the Avengers involves Steed and Peel going around and meeting quirky individuals. They typically investigate some kind of strange, mysterious crime or disturbance or something like that. And this usually involves uh, canvassing <laughs> through the English countryside, meeting a lot of quirky people. These characters might be satirical jabs at British high society, often they are, but they also are sometimes nods to the contemporary cultural underground. There are subversive characters and costumes in this movie, some very famous ones. And it's also a pretty campy show. Like I said earlier, it tends to veer into the surreal as Steed and Peel investigate potentially supernatural or super technological mysteries um, or anomalies, right? If you're curious about the Avengers, I would recommend the episode Murderersville, which uh, you can usually find on YouTube. This is one of the best episodes. I think it's, got, I think it's really nicely put together. In truth, the series has some ups and downs with plenty of episodes being a hodgepodge of 1960s sitcom standards. The show is kind of formulaic, but it's an interesting formula that is very particular to a place and time. Okay, it's a cool show. So what about this adaptation? How are you going to adapt that? Seems like this is a great idea, right? Well, the Avengers, the original, it was right at home at the time, besides shows like The Prisoner or The Saint or even The Man from U.N.C.L.E., old James Bond movies, all this stuff, you know, there was a context for it. But without that context, how are you going to replicate this? I said already, it's a tough decision you're going to face when making a new version. Do you keep the spirit of the original, the strange tone of the original, or do you abandon it um, and try to make something that's more accessible? Either way, you lose. You either alienate the fans or you make a movie that doesn't make any sense. Hmm. <laughs> now, honestly, I think the new movie actually leans more towards the original. Hmm, which is one reason why it was so poorly received. Unfortunately, it also makes a couple of crucial blunders that alienated all the fans of the original. Still, I think it actually leans a little bit farther into the past than towards something like more mainstream or whatever. Um, probably the most significant issues that, that angered original fans were that it introduces a romantic relationship between Peel and Steve. In the original series, they never consummate any kind of relationship like that. And it's, it's not really even a will they, won't they? Maybe a little bit. Um, but there's a certain dignity to their relationship that's pretty key to the tone or whatever. And they completely trample all over that in the new one. People didn't like that. The film also just kind of botches the Britishness of the original. So yeah, if you're British, you probably won't like this movie, uh, which is not ideal given that that's kind of the, the part of the target audience you would think for an adaptation of The Avengers. Um, where the original film had this delicate balance between a lot of different facets of British life, this kind of playful ribbing of this sort of more traditional thing, it, it's very finely balanced. That has all just been obliterated in the, in, the re, in the adaptation and replaced with some really cheesy British stereotypes. Um, yeah, they, they identified the hat and the cane, oh, drinking tea, whatever. They just turned that stuff up to 11 and sort of gloss over the actual uh, subtlety of the film, which, you know, that's common. Um, they also throw in a bunch of 1990s style crimes um, while they're at it. But actually, the biggest problem with this movie isn't, I think, the way it's betrayal. It's sort of um, betrayal of the original. It's actually just that the movie itself doesn't really make any sense. That's probably its biggest failing, and I'll come back to that. Just poor execution of the film um, in general. But 
we're, we're still talking about the spirit of the original. And like I said, not many people are going to think this. I think anybody who's seen the original is probably going to dislike the movie a lot, be really turned off by a few things. But to me, I actually think that the spirit of the original is kind of there. The dialogue, for instance, seems to follow somewhat from the original. Maybe there's a few more overt double entendres. Now, if you haven't seen the original, you're going to think, what the heck is it? What are they doing? You're going to think the dialogue is awful. And it's not like amazing, but I do think it's in the ballpark of the original. There are also a number of surreal elements in the film that I think are pretty decent. Emma finds herself in a weird hallway at one point that she can't escape. She's in this a room. She goes down a corridor. She, corridor, she finds herself back in the same room. It's kind of a, a nifty scene. There is a group of people dressed up as bears at one point. No, it isn't some sort of Grateful Dead thing. Um, it's just a strange criminal underground organization. Um, at one point, Steve gets trapped in a phone booth, and it starts snowing. Now, none of these moments is actually well-grounded in the plot at all. They kind of all fall flat in some ways. But the visuals and the tone in these, I think, are, again, actually in the ballpark of the surreal nature of the original. Of course, if you haven't seen the original, you're, again, probably going to wonder, what, what are they doing? <laughs> who, who, who came up with this? One of the main elements of the plot in the film is that someone is trying to buy and sell the weather. I'm going to spoil the movie a little bit. It's not good, so, you know. This plot, buying and selling the weather, actually sounds like it could be the plot of an episode of The Avengers. In fact, I kind of feel like this maybe was the plot of one of the episodes. I, I don't remember all the episodes I've seen, um, but that, that element is kind of, that kind of fits. That kind of feels right. You take all this and you throw in the right music. They use the original score, but they make it a bit worse with some 1990s uh, style. And hey, you throw in a, a cameo from Patrick nee, McNee on top of all of that, and you've got something. And if the rest of the movie wasn't bad, I actually think you might be on your way. And, you know, I think had they not, you know, committed a couple slightly unforgivable sins against the original, uh, they actually would be sort of in the ballpark of the tone. Kind of. Kind of. I mentioned already that the biggest problem with this movie is probably not actually the balance, I think. It's really just that it doesn't make any sense, right? The production of the film was extremely chaotic, I guess, and the version of it that got released was almost certainly not the best possible version of the film. I suspect that in a panic over the film's lack of quality, the studio cut it down significantly. And, I mean, maybe we should thank them for making it shorter so there's less of it for us to suffer through, but they seem to have removed a number of somewhat uh, crucial moments, uh, leaving huge, huge gaps in the, in the movie. I'll give you a couple examples, but this will be obvious when you watch it. I don't really need to spell it out. Um, I mentioned the three scenes earlier, the sort of surreal scenes. Well, yeah, none of them actually make any sense in the movie. Steed being trapped gets trapped in the phone book, phone booth, not the phone book. Um, it's not exactly clear why or how or what's going on there or, or why it's really in the movie. Um, one of the most infamous things is at the end of the film, Emma uses the password, how now, brown cow, to enter the bad guy's lair. But how does she know the password? Or why does he let him in? Makes no sense at all, right? There's a couple big jumps in the movie. You go from one place to another. Not really clear how you got there. Um, the, the old woman gets captured. She escapes. How does this happen? I don't know. There are much more fundamental issues, too, though. Um, like when the bad guy presents his ultimatum in front of this big congress of world leaders, he's unprotected. They could just shoot him, right? Or arrest him. Hmm. Not really that well thought out. The bad guy appears to have one henchman. Um, it's not really clear how he carries out all of his plans with so few people, or again, why the military powers don't just, you know, overrun his organization. I mentioned earlier there's this council of people in bear costumes. Well, that goes absolutely nowhere. The whole thing, yeah, it's really not clear what, 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 what's going on there. And the, the, there's so many elements of this, of this film, so many elements of the plot that just kind of peter out and disappear, right? Beyond the plot being incoherent, though, the movie also just has huge problems with the kind of the arc of the story. I guess you might say that the pacing is off because the movie starts quite slowly, much more slowly than an episode of the TV show would. Um, maybe it's fine for a movie to take more time. It's got to introduce us to the characters. The, the, the movie has uh, Peel and Steed meet for the first time in it, which if I were them, I wouldn't have done um, because they use up a lot of time in setting up how they get to know each other or whatever. Um, the movie, you know, starts off slowly, but overall, it's actually only about twice as long as an episode of the TV show. Hmm. So at some point, 
things start moving way faster because they want to stick this huge Hollywood ending in there. In the original show, actually, many episodes have kind of dinky endings where they sort of realize, oh, the hour's almost up. Quick, we got to end it. And then there's a, a, a few punches are thrown and everything uh, goes back to normal or something like that. Well, here we have a huge, huge outlandish over-the-top Hollywood ending. And yeah, the pacing is just completely screwed up, basically. The film is muddled in multiple dimensions, which almost sounds like the title of an episode of The Avengers, multi-dimensional muddle. Having said all that, though, I didn't hate watching the movie. Um, and I think people go overboard when criticizing it. I know it's a far cry from the original, but honestly, the original show also has plenty of issues of its own. Okay. <laughs> I realize I haven't exactly articulated what I liked about it. Um, yeah, well, like I said, it's not a great movie, but I do think some of the spirit is there. It is kind of interesting to see what they're going to try to do in terms of an adaptation. Um, it does have some... Funny is not quite the right word, um, but it kind of captures the spirit a little bit, and it is sort of generally amusing, at least. It's sort of fun. I want to take a, uh, a minute or two to talk about more analytical things, though. That's what really matters. Um, there's a couple things on my mind. I'm not going to go super deep into this movie, but let's see. First, Eddie Izzard, he's in the movie, or she's in the movie, Susie Izzard, I guess. Now, although I'm not totally up to get up to date, either way, this character, I guess, is coded as gay. And that might seem a little bit regressive because he's a bad guy. Um, he gets one line, which I can't say in this video without <laughs> YouTube getting upset. Um, he being the character, um, I guess. I mentioned that the original series is pretty campy. That is almost totally eliminated. And the somewhat regrettable romance between Peel and Steed, I guess it casts sort of a heterosexual shadow over the whole thing. Um, so, yeah, you might see this Izzard character as regressive, or maybe it's just the, the last, like, dying gasp of the campy nature of the original. I don't really know what to make of it. I don't really have a complete thought here, but the gender and sexuality in the show and in the series are totally different. I talked about this a little bit already with the original, um, how, how Emma Peel strikes this nice balance between something pretty conventional, some more traditional society, and something that's more empowered or whatever. Um, she has a, an extremely graceful way of mitigating those two things. I've noticed, yeah, there's, there's a lot of, sometimes movies in, in the past that have resonated with people, uh, one thing that, that you can see is a graceful way for balancing uh, different social demands, characters that embody a graceful way of balancing social demands. Another character that does that, famously, Holly Golightly, I would say. Um, delicately balancing, gracefully balancing different social demands. Emma Peel definitely does that. Um, the new one, uh, I don't know. It does something different. For one thing, it invokes some very like 1980s, 1990s battle of the sexes rhetoric. For instance, when Emma first meets Steed, he's in some kind of private gentleman's club. Only, only men are allowed in. She barges her way past the doorman and into this club, and she meets Steed uh, up, up the stairs in some kind of bathhouse or sauna. He isn't wearing any clothing, right? Um, here we have an immediate sort of romantic undertone, first of all. It's kind of the classic 90s romantic comedy situation where it's like, oh, meeting in, in an uncompromising, or meeting in a compromising situation, right? That's a bit of a trope. Um, yeah, a bit of a trope. It's kind of a weird one because there's sort of a fantasy element um, to this in some ways, um, but I don't know. So we have this, like I said, immediately we're already into heterosexual romance territory, but there's also kind of a bold political statement here about the stodginess of British culture, right? Oh, oh it's, this club has been only men. It's the, it's the literal old boys club, right? The original doesn't have either of these things at all. And maybe in some ways, we're trying to update the story. We're trying to bring things into the future. Maybe we should be making some point about, hey, wait a minute, wasn't, isn't the original like pretty stodgy? Um, even with its sort of lighthearted take on the like aristocratic gentleman or whatever, isn't it still pretty stodgy? Well, maybe. Maybe they're trying to just bring it into the um, 20th century, I guess you would say. But eh, they don't get it right. They don't get it right. Yeah. I, I want to talk a little bit about cloning. I think um, the plot of the movie kind of revolves around cloning. I mentioned the weather. Well, cloning is kind of the other big thing. The details here are really vague. There are two M appeals, apparently, or at least two, maybe more. Um, 
At first, actually, the organization brings in Mrs. Peel because it appears that she committed a crime. They catch her on tape um, stealing some, something from a lab, and um, she's hauled in. Rather than, like, arresting her, though, or imprisoning her or doing something, they say, okay, now you've got to work with Steed to prove that it wasn't you. Uh, this doesn't make any sense at all, but that's how the movie kind of gets going. Now, in a twist that surprises absolutely nobody, it turns out that the bad guys can clone people, and, of course, this Emma that was captured on video is the evil Emma. Um, I, think clone, I think of cloning as a trope of 1960s television. It's maybe, maybe a little bit more broad than cloning, actually. I'd put, like, imposters or robots that look like people or body swaps or maybe even hypnosis all kind of into this same category of, you know, things that look like me but are not me, right? Hey, that's, that looks like me, but that's, that's not what I would do. And this idea maybe goes, you know, way back in, in movies as well. Um, right, to, uh, to vampires, to zombies, Frankenstein's monster. It goes back to literature as well, I guess. Um, this idea of things that, that look like us but aren't us. And maybe these fears are rooted in real-world contagion, disease, silent killers, or something like that. Or maybe it's something ideological, right? The idea of a stranger walking among us, xenophobia um, in some ways. Maybe it has something to do with stardom, you know, um, the playing against the, the image of an actor or something like that. Maybe it's just cheap to do the special effects when people look like people, but they don't act like each other. I'm not going to go into it too deeply. I actually have a book all about replication right here called Replications. I read this a long time ago. Um, it's all over the place in film. And yeah, there's a number of episodes of uh, the original series that involve some of these plot lines. They're kind of stock plots from the 1960s. I've never thought these were the best episodes. And if I was going to cherry pick elements from the original, I sure wouldn't have chosen cloning. There's an episode of the original that is kind of interesting, though, where two bad guys switch bodies with Peel and Steed. The episode gets a lot of mileage out of the bad guys doing things that Peel and Steed would never do. The fake Steed drinks cheap wine, for instance, right? Smokes cheap cigars. And the humor in this comes from the dissonance between the image and the character, um, right? Or the, the, the image of this character and like the deeper essence of the character, the persona, the personality, something like that. I bring this up because these cloning plot lines tend to be pretty imagistic. And maybe this concept of replication itself is hinting towards the postmodern, right? In the new movie, it almost doesn't feel like there is any character M appeal. Instead, it's more like, oh, 90s catsuit action lady and 90s catsuit action lady villain, right? Um, we've sort of eschewed the essence of the character and, and settled more on the image of them in some ways. It might be a bit of a stretch, but it's worth noting that in The Avengers, the one from 2012 that I said I would never talk about on this channel, um, well, you know, that, that movie really kicked uh, postmodern Hollywood into its highest um, and worst gear, started up this idea of a universe where images and symbols were really the only thing, and that is in some ways not that disconnected from some of these cloning things, some of, this, uh, some of these imagistic plot lines that were even in the original series, certainly embodied a little bit by the new movie as well. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. I want to talk about technology a little bit. Obviously, the original series features a bunch of fantastical technology. I think the, the uh, manipulation of weather is a, is a, it's a good idea, like I said already, but it is noticeable that the scope of the, of the movie is totally different from the scope of the show. The show is pretty whimsical, and the bad guys never really do anything too crazy. Yeah, they will murder some people in a circuitous and bizarre fashion, but usually it's only a couple of people, and the end goal is like to take over a business, right? Or to steal some money, or covering up some conspiracy, or something like that. There is one episode where almost the entire organization is destroyed, but it's usually not so extreme. In the movie, they're talking about renting the weather to every country in the world. This is an extent existential threat, right? Um, okay, maybe you need to raise the stakes when you're making a movie, um, or maybe people were just feeling frisky because Y2K was coming up. Either way, it really changes the tone of the movie from something like a profoundly lighthearted uh, TV show um, to something a little bit darker that, that doesn't, doesn't, quite, doesn't quite land. 
it also gives you a totally different view of technology. The original has sort of a quirky futurism, right? That's kind of like, kind of tied into the sort of the 1950s, like, you know, optimistic modernism and the, you know, the Walt Disney America and the fancy kitchens and all this stuff. Like, sort of part and parcel with that is the, is the quirky sort of modernism of, of some 1960s things where things start to fall apart or become a little bit um, absurd, I guess you might say, right? Um, so, like I said, playful, absurdist modernism, whereas the movie is existential and it's apocalyptic, right? I think this was maybe a bit too early for widespread fear of climate change, but hey, this is a movie about weather, so maybe there's some connection there. I don't know. Did people's view of technology change drastically between the 1960s and the 1990s? I mean, in some ways, I'm sure it did change to some extent. Is that the only reason why these things are different? Uh, I don't know exactly. Um, but it's, it's worth noting that the very different things going on with technology between the series and the film. Okay, I want to talk about one more thing, then I'll shut up. The last thing is just that you never figure out who exactly the organization is in the series or in the film. And that's kind of interesting. There are hints of its structure, of its relationships with the government, but it's never really clear what this spy ring is. And in fact, their obscurity is often sort of played up. There's often jokes about this. In some episodes, Steed and Peel go to visit the leader, mother, they call him, in his base at the bottom of a lake, or, you know, he rides around on a double-decker bus or something like that. It's kind of deliberately outlandish and, you know, sort of poking fun at the government in some ways, sort of poking fun at conspiracies. Um, even in more serious shows, it's common to have these shadowy organizations, more serious shows from that era. It's kind of the hallmark of the era. Either an organization is never really described, it's just in the shadows, or it's kind of outlandish, like uncle or chaos and control, right? Um, probably your first thought is that, well, this is all about the Cold War, right? And hey, I mean, definitely the Cold War is a time of lots of shadowy organizations, um, fears of outsiders penetrating America, all this stuff, right? But, so, plausible, yes, but is that the same thing that's going on in the movie from 1998? Well, maybe. What about the Avengers movie from 2012, which also features kind of a weird, undefined, shadowy organization? What exactly is behind all these fantastic, extra-social organizations? That's the question. Anyway, I may have already read too much into this movie, uh, there's a lot more to say about the original series, honestly. It's it's surprisingly deep in some ways, but I'll leave that for another day. If you've watched The Avengers, um, the original series in particular, I'm curious what you think was the key to that series. What what made it special to you? Maybe it was Diana Rigg. <laughs> Maybe that's it. Um, but I do think it's it's pretty interesting balance that it strikes. So let me know if you have any ideas about that. Otherwise, I'll see you next week.